Thanks, Joel. So good. Thank you for leading us. Uh, I want to invite Dion Muhammad up to the stage as she uh, comes to share her story. Um, as she comes, she's going to um, tell you about her life, but let me just give you a brief introduction uh, for, for you. Uh, Dion is an Indigenous woman, wife, mother, counselor, and educator. She's a daughter and granddaughter of people who went to residential school and all of the trauma and all of the impacts of that. But Dion is a woman who also has met Jesus, and he has changed a lot of that trajectory. She says that through her educational journey, God or creator revealed his profound love for her. And so she's here through the power of the Spirit to share and bring you in on the impact of Jesus in her life and, and her world and how it's been changed by, by Jesus Christ. Interestingly, Dion graduated in 2021 from the University of Victoria uh, in a master's of social work, successfully defending her thesis entitled Intergenerational Trauma and Stories of Healing Through Jesus in a secular university. And so um, Dion is the real deal, and she's here to come and share. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm very old school, and so I'm, I'm more of a paper kind of girl, and they've accommodated this for me, so <laughs> thank you. It's such an honor to be here today. I'd like to begin with a personal territory acknowledgement that I wrote a few years ago as I wanted it to be personal and to speak to how I honor the gift the Shaquemun peoples have given me to have been able to reside and raise my family here for the last 14 years. I acknowledge with humility and respect the land on which I have settled as an uninvited visitor to stat, as an uninvited Statlium person on the unceded territories of the Shaquemun peoples. And as I begin each day, I intentionally remember that the Shaquemun peoples have never surrendered or abandoned their traditional territory, but have, main have maintained stewardship over their land, waters, and communities since time immemorial. And I humbly respect and acknowledge Shaquemun knowledge keepers leaders and elders, past, present, and emerging. I acknowledge what a privilege it is that the Shaquemun peoples and visiting Indigenous families to this sovereign territory allow me to walk beside them, their children and youth, on their healing journeys. As a Statlium visitor and ally, I commit to the ongoing learning of Shaquemun history and traditional protocols upholding and standing behind the Shaquemun peoples and their ways of knowing and being, and standing beside them in any endeavors to preserve their rightful title to their lands and resources gifted them by the Creator. I remember and respectfully acknowledge that the land on which I work and raise my family were defended by Shaquemun peoples through the bloodshed of their ancestors as they defended infringement upon their land base by other nations. And it is with these in mind that I walk gently on the soil of the Shaquemun peoples with the understanding of how colonization continues to impact indigenous nations across Turtle Island and beyond. And it is my duty as a visitor to do no harm to Shaquemun land, waters, or peoples, and upon my departure to leave their traditional territory having given, not taken away. All right, so my name is Dion Muhammad, and I'm gonna unpack that a little bit. My last name is Muhammad, and I am a follower of Jesus Christ. After marriage, I took my husband's last name. I was happy to have taken my husband's last name as a symbol of our two lives becoming one. And over the years, I wrestled with the contradiction that came along uh, with being a follower of Jesus and also having a name associated with Islam. 
I brought this concern to the Lord and sat with it for a while. And he showed me this. What could be more powerful in a testimony than my name being attached to Islam, but my heart belonging to Jesus? So he took my name and has used it as a door by providing me with opportunities to share Jesus in my personal testimony of sal salvation. So for example, people have kindly pointed out to me, you wear a cross, but your last name is Muhammad. And there the door opens and I get to share my testimony of how Jesus became my personal savior. Traditionally, me as an indigenous person, um, and most traditional um, ways within our culture is how we introduce ourselves with our names, our nation of origin, our band name, our family name, our indigenous grandparents name. Um, it's quite the ceremony. So this information alone tells my new ind indigenous relatives something about my ways of knowing and being, the values and ethics that I hold. Whether we are fishers, hunters, or gatherers, or maybe all, and forms a tie between myself and them. And then this is the starting point by which we forge relationship. So it would look something like this. My name is Dion Muhammad, and I am from the nation of the Statlian peoples. And I also have settler roots through my non-Indigenous dad. I am currently an uninvited visitor to the unceded lands of the Shaquetman peoples, where I lived and worked for more than 14 years now. Now it could stop there, but I'm gonna keep going. <clears throat> I am a mother of four children, two sons and two daughters. My sons, Malik and Trey, are 25 and 27. My daughters, Asha and Maya, are 14 and 21, and they are the joy of my heart. But I did not bring them into this world alone. God blessed me 26 years ago with uh, a husband, Said, also known as Sonny. God knew what it would take. It would take a special man to love me the way I needed to be loved as I struggled with the impact of generational trauma. His parents immigrated from Pakistan to the lands currently known as Canada. And after 26 years, he remains my best friend. I am also a daughter of a residential school and Indian day school survivor, and a granddaughter of residential school and Indian day school survivors. My indigenous grandparents were both fluent in Statlium. I have a beautiful memory as a child when we went to visit my grandparents on our reserve. My grandparents would work up, wake up very early in the morning and I can remember hearing them in the kitchen together from my bed where I was, where I was sleeping and they would be speaking Statlium together. And every once in a while I would hear my grandma giggle and, and at something my grandfather had said. Um, I had no idea what they were saying, but that's just a beautiful memory. They were both fluent speakers of our traditional language my grandfather's indigenous name was taken from him when he was taken from his parents at four years of age and brought to residential school. I realize now that although speaking our indigenous language was prohibited in residential school through physical punishment, he was able to keep it hidden inside and never lost his native tongue. My mother attended both residential school and Indian day school for several years. She attended Indian day school where she was physically abused and mentally and emotionally traumatized. When she was sent away to Kamloops Indian residential school, she seldom got time to visit home. My mom recalls going home to visit her parents. And when she walked into her house, she remembers sitting on the couch and everyone was silent. She said, we had all become strangers. 
Any attachment she had with her parents before she was taken was gone. Sadly, my Indigenous grandparents were only sporadically in my life throughout my childhood and adolescence. And due to my mother's time spent in residential school and Indian day school, as well as her own intergenerational trauma, she was unprepared to be a full-time parent to my brother and I. And therefore, we were raised by my dad's parents for much of our childhood. My dad's parents are of Mauritian ancestry through my grandmother and English through my grandfather. My grandfather was white and my grandmother, who was black, they were both very in love and had nine children together. And despite how society frowned upon interracial marriage, they made an amazing, beautiful life together. My dad was born in Mission and moved to Lillooet with his family when he was still quite young. My grandmother, my dad, and my aunties and uncles were the only back people in town. So my dad's first experience with racism was during his childhood when he was called one of the most dehumanizing pejoratives a black person could be called. He recalls not knowing what the word meant, but remembers turning and walking away with tears welling in his eyes. He remembers not being able to see where he was going because his vision was blurred by tears. This incident would sow a seed of pain, which would turn into anger and then eventually violence. Due to the racism he continued to face in his life, as well as the abuses he suffered growing up, his violence put him on a very dark and destructive path, which my brother and I were exposed to. I recall being seven years old, and to this point, I had already seen such evil and felt such paralyzing fear. I can remember being very little and being hit in the chest with an all-encompassing darkness that wrapped itself around me and suffocated me. And as a child, I thought others could see it too. But when I looked around, no one seemed to notice. And I found out later in life that this darkness was a symptom of the generational trauma that I was diagnosed with, um, as well as clinical depression at 23 years of age. At seven years of age, I saw a change happen in my mom. I didn't know she had received Jesus into her heart, but I knew I wanted what she had. I asked Jesus to come into my heart and started preaching the gospel in grade three out on the playground. By day two and three, I had a crowd of kids crisscross applesauce, on the ground, in the field, listening intently as I told them about my Jesus. All I knew is that I wanted everyone to feel the way that I felt. And because my mom and dad both came to Jesus, but then backslid, the trauma in mine and my brother's lives continued. And I knew that if Jesus wasn't in my heart through those later years, I would have never known the pure love of not only a savior, but he also became the father and mother to me that my parents weren't capable of giving me at that time. But even within all of this chaos, my dad still found time to teach me about the civil rights movement and Dr. Martin Luther King. He taught me about the Holocaust and the genocide of over six million Jews, God's chosen people. And he taught me about colonialism and the losses my people had suffered. Because of my dad's teachings, my flame for social justice, advocacy, and social work in service to my people was ignited. So fast forward to 2010, and my husband and I, along with our children, moved from my reserve in Shalath, BC, to Kamloops as we not only wanted to give our four children more opportunities that our reserve couldn't offer, but we also felt a tug from God that it was time. We didn't know what it was time for, but we trusted in him. And with only enough money for five months of rent, we took a leap of faith. 
Four days after we moved into our rental home, I got a call for work after being told there was no work at one of the schools I had applied to and would begin the following month full-time. Within a month, God provided my husband with full-time work. Our father took care of us, and we continued to surrender all into his hands. After a year of work, I applied to TRU's Human Service Diploma Program and was denied. I was devastated. I thought, God, is this not what you're wanting me to do with my life? Yet God kept impressing it upon me not to give up. So I applied again the following year and was accepted. So down the road, upon entering the Master of Social Work Indigenous Specialization Program at the University of Victoria, I had already experienced grueling years, four years of undergrad studies to complete a bachelor's degree in social work. And it was during those years that I observed how my healing path was absent within the academic literature, curriculum, and the wellness models presented to us. I had always understood that my, my walk with Jesus was a lonely one. But I also knew that it was only through a personal relationship with Jesus where the wounds from my generational trauma and the trauma that I had experienced as a child were healed. I also knew that it was through Jesus that I got my mother back as a healthy part of my life and that it was only through Jesus that my dad changed from a violent man who had spent time in prison to a loving father whom I no longer feared. So upon entering the master's program, I was both excited and fearful at the prospect of connecting with other indigenous students as well as indigenous knowledge keepers. But what I feared was rejection due to my faith as I had experienced by my people in the past so I brought my fears to the Father, the Creator, and asked him to reveal to me why he had opened the door which allowed me admission to UVic. I knew I was there to fulfill his purpose and to carry out his work. I just couldn't see how. And within the first few days of our intensive, I began to hear the words of the knowledge keepers. I heard message I hadn't, messages I hadn't heard before in an academic setting. I heard my story mattered, my truth mattered and needed to be shared. And moreover, my truth held sacred indigenous knowledges and teachings needed for my people for their healing journeys. I heard that my story was medicine for my people. So in that moment, God showed me how he would open the door for me to be able to share my witness simply because it was my truth, my healing, and Jesus was my medicine. And what you need to know is that Satan had tried to take my life three times by attacking my body with acute ailments, beginning in 2002, again in 2010, and once more while I was writing my master's thesis entitled intergenerational trauma in stories of healing through Jesus. I firmly believe that Satan understood the implications of the message that Christ was speaking through me to his indigenous sons and daughters. My body by this time was so tired and worn and I contacted my professor saying that I just didn't feel that I could go on. She was not even a follower of Jesus, but she wrote back saying, that while she would support me if I wanted to change my route and, and do a practicum placement, she felt strongly that this work was necessary. And I remember leaning into Jesus' side, worn and tired, and asking him to give me strength. And like every other time before, each near-death experience brought me closer to my Savior. I refused to lament and be mad at God and trusted in his word and remembered Job's words, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. A strength that I cannot explain was released within me. Almost a year to the day I wanted to quit, 
I passed my thesis defense in front of a panel of esteemed but secular academics and knowledge keepers. It's also important to say that none of my experience is because of anything I am except for what God has done and imparted to me through his son, my savior, Jesus Christ. Because honestly, I'm simply a small town indigenous girl who grew up on a homestead by the river in a one street town who was told several times in her life that she was not smart enough to do anything of significance. But they didn't know who my father was and the things that he had planned for my life. Today, I get to walk beside indigenous children, youth and adults who are on their healing journeys. And every day I have to surrender my all into his hands and in faith, because it is all only through him that I am able to rest and know that he has everything under control. Today I have a blessed relationship with my parents as they both returned to Jesus. And after being divorced for several years, God restored their relationship through him and they remarried. And this year will mark 32 years in their second marriage to each other. Today, I can honest, thank you, Jesus. Today, I can honestly say that I am truly thankful for everything I experienced as a child, as horrible as it was, and I hold no bitterness towards my parents. Had I not gone through all of that, I could never understand the suffering of my people. And in fact, my mom carried out such a great act of love by making one of the most difficult decisions a mother could make. She gave my brother and I over to my grandparents where she knew we would be loved and cared for. Today, I love my mom and my dad very much. My dad is now a self-taught Bible scholar, and he has a deep and profound relationship with the Lord. My mom is the prayer warrior for our family, and I know that it is because of the hours she has spent in intercession for me that any stronghold Satan has tried to bind me with have been broken. And because of our shared faith in Jesus, I have entered into a new relationship, a renewed relationship with my parents, full of love, respect, and care for one another. And I know that this could have never happened outside of Jesus. My love for Jesus, my family, my strong connection to the land of my Statlian peoples, and the infinite love that the Creator has placed in my heart for my peoples keep me grounded and moving forward when the darkness of my past tries to suffocate and extinguish the light that Christ has given me. And although I'm on a lifelong journey of healing, my Savior walks beside me, sometimes carrying me. And through him, the generational trauma passed down from my ancestors to my grandparents and from my grandparents to my mom has ended with me. Thank you, Jesus. Well done, Casey. Well done. Very good. Dion, thank you. Um, I don't know if you've ever shared your entire life story in front of a hundred, few hundred people you've never met before, but it takes some courage. Um, so, Dion, thank you. Uh, I, I, I just think it, uh, by, by you having the courage to stand on the stage and share your story, it just builds bridges for everybody in the room, indigenous or non-indigenous, that um, empathy increases and understanding increases, and uh, man, that's the future. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm welcome to the living room. Uh, we're we're going to just have a little Q&A uh, as far as their insight into kind of what we're doing, Indigenous relationships with the church, Canada, 
how, what's the way forward? And so I, I wanna speak as, as little as possible and get them talking. And so, um, friends, uh, why don't you share just a little bit? We had a conference here yesterday. Why don't you share a little bit, uh, just your reflections on the weekend so far, this initiative uh, in our church uh, as guests. What, what are you seeing? Yeah, I, I really appreciated being here uh, this weekend. This is my first time in Kamloops, and um, I heard a little bit about this from my dad before I came, but like I hadn't met you before, I hadn't met Norm before, uh, so I, I really appreciated the opportunity to come here. Um, and I think what I've experienced in other churches is often when we're talking about reconciliation, we, we love the idea of reconciliation, but we don't have an idea of what we're going to do to, to pursue reconciliation. So there's, uh, I think the term I would use is option paralysis. You know, there's like all these things we could do, but what's, yeah. what's the thing that we're gonna serve the best? Like what's the, yeah. like our community's best foot forward in, in, in this way? Right. It's really hard to make that decision. And sometimes I think we often make no decision as a result. Uh, and the people that I've met here on the Indigenous Connections team, as well as in conversation during the conference yesterday, um, there's just a, a heart of, we really want to be about this. Let's start and <laughs> figure it out as we go along, right? I, I think I think the the courage to do that is a very necessary part of of, of justice and of following Jesus as well. Great, Dion. Yeah. Um, this is really what drew me here. Um, I remember we, my husband and I and our children started coming to church here in 2010 and not, um, not all the time, but, uh, but when we could. And so I can remember coming a, a few years ago and I, and I heard you do a land acknowledgement and I was blown away because I, I was, I've never heard that in a church before, but instantly there was something inside of me that said, oh, I belong. This is a place where I could belong. And so, um, and then I, I saw your website and, and saw the, the work that you're doing for reconciliation. And I was um, so drawn to that and then um, reached out and got connected with Elder Norm. And um, it just seems like God had just put everything in place for that. And I think that had you not taken up that work um, in courage, um, I don't know if any of this would have come to pass. So, yeah, it's, it's an amazing thing. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for being a part of uh, something that we really don't know what we're doing. <laughs> um, uh, and, and investing and helping us along this journey. There is no roadmap ahead, and yet the church, we believe, is called to justice into these areas that are really uncomfortable. A question I have is, what makes this conversation so hard about reconciliation with the church? I mean, nationally, of course, there's lots of different things. I'm thinking about the church. What, what makes this so hard? Um, that's a, that's, there's, I think a lot of things, uh, like there's the obvious answers of, of, of the history of it. And I think for indigenous people, we often have a hard time separating the person of Jesus with the people of Jesus or the people who, 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 who have done things in the name of Jesus. And like, it, it's very hard to separate those things. And also like, uh, I think as people who go to church and, and follow Jesus as the best we can, we like to think of ourselves as good people. And so there's, there needs to, the, like the, the hard part is acknowledging not only the harm that our ancestors caused, but the harm that we're causing. And it's hard, like if you've never been confronted with that before, it's a very hard truth to, to contend with. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I agree. I think that um, because there is such a long history of um, what the church um, did um, back during colonization and how Jesus's name was used, like you said, um, as a means to, um, to quite frankly, um, perpetrate harms against my people. Um, I think that there's a lot of mistrust for my people when it comes to a church because Christi the term Christian, even in acad academia, isn't 
it's, it's all painted with one brush stroke. So nobody, our people don't see um, denominations. They see the church, the damage it has done um, because of residential school and Indian day school. So um, it's, it's building that trust with, with um, our people and, and reaching out and not always expecting them to come here, but going and visiting them in their places and in their homes and, um, and just building relationship so that they can see it's, it's not even about the church, the building, it's just bringing Jesus and, um, and, and having those conversations and, and reaching out, I think is really important. Yeah, friendship and connection, yeah. Um, talk to me a little bit about, um, so obviously this is like, uh, indigenous people in Canada have faced this, there's all of these things running, um, in the narrative and kind of consciousness of Indigenous people. Talk to me a little bit about uh, how Jesus has helped you through those very challenges. Dion, you shared a little bit. Uh, I'd love to hear more of an expanding of that, but, but Joel, how has Jesus helped you through? Um, I know your family, your dad went to residential school, and so obviously this is very close to you. How has Jesus helped you through those very challenges you just talked about? Yeah, you know, <laughs> I think... I think for a lot of us, we we can look at the church, we can look at followers of Jesus, we can look at the scriptures, we can we can look at all kinds of things, uh, and I think we can follow Jesus to a point. But at some point, we encounter Jesus, um, and and for me, that's I, I I feel like I've encountered Jesus in relationship uh, with with my father, with my grandfather. Um, there's there's like a history of of following Jesus in my family, but also of Jesus miraculously delivering people from bondage and from, from, from pain and from all, like, you know, the, the, the testimony of that is present. So, you know, it never in my growing up have I been like struggled with who Jesus is and what he does. Um, so that like that just checked a lot of boxes for things I might've struggled with in this regard. Um, and, I think to like a, a tenet I have in my life is to try to assume that people are trying their best. Right. Um, try to assume people are trying their best, and so and especially as it comes to Christians. So <laughs> I, I said in the first service, I've had a lot of racist things said to me, but mostly by accident. Right. People. People. People are curious, and I'm a very open person, so they come to ask me questions, and sometimes they phrase it in a way that would be very offensive if I didn't have this assumption that they're trying their best and they would like to understand. Um, and I think, I think Jesus has has a lot of grace. Like when I when I see him in Scripture, you know, <laughs> all the disciples they're trying they're trying their best, but they're like they're pretty yeah. pretty rough yeah sometimes like I, I i love i love the person of peter in in scripture because peter's the guy you need to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing to make the story interesting every time he comes up yeah. in scripture yeah. he's saying the wrong thing and and i think i think jesus the way jesus interacts with peter is is a way that i would like to be in the world that's good that's good john how yeah, of course. Uh, how has Jesus helped you through those very challenges that you outlined with kind of this skeptical, hesitant posture of Indigenous people in Canada, and yet you are speaking at a church this morning? So how has Jesus helped you through those challenges of your own? Yeah, I think that my educational journey had a big, um, uh, had a big part to play. I felt it was my... I, I, God really impressed upon my heart such a love for my people, and I and I didn't know what to do with that. And I wanted to know, God, how how do I how do I help? And I, of course, I know what the answer is. But um, as an Indigenous person, we're not always given a platform to be able to have our voices heard. And so I understood that in order for that to happen, I would need to um, to become educated and really did a deep dive into my people's history um, and spent a lot of time with elders and knowledge keepers, um, heard, sat by people's firesides and heard their stories. And so once I could really um, understand the history of our people and how that has played out 
um, into the state that my people are in today, it just became, um, God really showed me that my people, uh, my people needed someone who could understand them and someone who looked like them that can understand them. And not to say that, um, not, that non-Indigenous peoples shouldn't be helpers to my people. We need allies. Um, but it's, it's just very different um, when you have someone who looks like you, who has had the same colonial history as you um, and has, has had healing because they're always going to ask the question, well, how did you heal from all of those things? And then I could share my, my testimony, but I really knew that without, um, for myself, um, I, I, the way that I could um, reach uh, my people in, in a broader way was, was through education. That's good. Uh, what would you say to those Indigenous people in this room uh, or online, or streaming online, um, who have yet to experience the freedom that you are experiencing. Um, caught in addiction, caught in unhealthy, toxic environments. What would you say to those people who look at you and say, that will never be me? Um, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a tough question. I think uh, when, when I share the gospel with people, what I often say is, um, the gospel is that God not only loves you, but knows you. God knows everything about you and loves you because of what he knows about you. And not only does he love you, not only does he know you, but he pursues us in the person of Jesus um, through, through his birth, through his life, through his teaching, through his death on the cross. God is pursuing a relationship with us. Um, and what I love about this idea of being known and loved by God is it means that the shame that we have can't keep us away from being in a relationship with God. And I think a lot of people deal with shame. Um, and I think a lot of people find it hard to be in relationship with other people and with God because of the shame that they feel. And, you know, the the scriptures and 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 also my experience of being in a relationship with Jesus just are just constantly saying the shame is not the point. The fact that I know you, the fact that I love you, and the fact that I'm chasing after you is what matters. And as indigenous people, I, I, I love the scripture in Revelations where it talks about people of every tribe, tongue, and nation standing before the throne of God and worshiping together because, you know, I think we have this vision of heaven where everyone's in a white robe and they all look the same. There's like a, you know, but, but that's not the picture that we're given in scripture. I think there's going to, be people of every color, in every color, and speaking every language, wearing the regalia of their people, um, worshiping God together. That's a really beautiful thing, and I think indigenous people need to be a part of that. Like, Canadian indigenous people need to be a part of that. Yeah, that's cool. What would you say, Dion, to somebody indigenous who kind of looks at your stories, you said, you know, where you grew up and, you know, what the Lord has done in your life, who just says, that'll never be me. What would you say? I would say that um, Jesus meets you where you're at. You don't have to wait to, to give up substances. You don't have to say, well, I need to do X, Y, and Z first. He is there with you in the trenches. He is there with you in your sorrow. He is there with you um, in your darkness. Um, when Jesus walked the earth, he wasn't found in some big uh, fancy cathedrals. He was um, with the people who were sick and um, people living in poverty, um, with the tax collectors. Um, you know, he, he went out and pursued people. And so um, I just want my people to know that, that the same great spirit that our people have had a relationship with time immemorial um, is the same God that um, that lives today, and that um, that He's always had us at the forefront of His mind, and so He's He's there. Just just call on His name. He's going to meet you right where you're at. Awesome. Uh, as you look out into our crew here this morning, uh, lots of us aren't Indigenous, and so my question is, what would you say? 
to the non-Indigenous people in this room. Uh, I just know in circles I run in and friendships that I have, um, there can be an exhaustion with the Indigenous conversation in Canada as a non-Indigenous person. Um, uh, and so that, that may be present here this morning. Um, and then there's people in this room who are like, yeah, we love it. But what would you say to our church, uh, the non-Indigenous in this room, uh, about this initiative, about an encouraging word for us to keep going? Uh, whatever you'd want to say, I think it's just uh, uh, an insight from you would be helpful on that. I, I think this won't be encouraging at the beginning, but... <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be a spanking. And you know, then a <laughs> the, the idea of exhaustion around, around the Indigenous conversation is, is a very short-sighted way to view it because you're participating in the story right now. You, you can't not talk about something you're actively participating in. Um, so, we, you know, tough luck if you're tired of talking about it. You're, it's, uh, like, that's, that's my answer to that. And... and, and you know, scriptures tells us, as we sang this morning, to, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. You know, whenever, whenever we, whenever Jesus talks about, or whenever the Bible talks about justice, it always, almost always follows it up with mercy. I don't know if you've ever noticed that when you read yeah. the scripture. Mercy and justice are like, are like this. So I think we often think of justice as like justice against, you know, this person did this, so the just thing for, to happen is them to be punished. But that's actually not what justice is. Justice is when things are the way God meant for them to be. And we don't get, have the privilege of not participating in justice. You know, there's, there's, there's a cost to following Jesus. There's a cost to, to being a Christian. And you have to pay it. You can't, you can't, you don't get to sit idly by. Um, and, and the encouraging part is this. As you enter into a relationship with people, as you seek reconciliation with them, the, it'll enrich your life. Um, and as you do the work that seems impossible, God will empower you through the power of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, I think you're going to look back on the work that you've done in your life at some point and be like, I can't believe these things that have happened because God's, gonna, God's hand is going to be present to you as you, as you do this work. John, what would you say is uh, kind of a, for those people, I mean, across a lot, lot of spectrum here in this room, what would you say is an encouragement for us to keep going even though it is challenging and it is uncomfortable and we don't have the answers and it's a little messy? Speak to us. Yeah, um, I would refer to the Bible as well. What does God say um, about justice and about um, mercy and and uh, empathy and all of those things. Um, and, and what I also want to say is for non-Indigenous peoples, it's not your fault, but it is absolutely your responsibility. And so um, Nikki Sanchez, she um, that's a quote by her and that's always stuck with me. And so... Um, and that being said, it's that's part of um, the reconciliation, the vision that that is being done here. And and like Chris said, it's not true. We never know exactly where God is going to leave and what He's doing. And sometimes it's about just hopping on for the ride and and seeing where you can help and what you can do. And um, but also educating yourselves on Indigenous history. Um, the land that you're on, um, going out and, and you know meeting people where where they're at. Um, go and meet the chief of of Tekemlu's Tikshikwetmik and have conversations and and be curious and come from a place of not knowing. There's there's no shame in that, and um, yeah, it's not your fault, but it is your responsibility. It's a great way to end. It's not your fault, but it is a responsibility, and so. Um, thank you for your courage to be here, to share your gifts and your story. Um, Dion, your family, too, has been here all weekend, so thank you guys for coming and showing up. Um, so thank you, thank you. Thank you from KAC, um, from this non-Indigenous lead pastor. My heart is just overflowing with gratitude for you uh, and your place in the church and that your voice matters and we need to hear it. I also want to say... Uh, 
to you, Casey. Thank you for your courage. This is not an easy conversation. There's so much that we all bring into this room about this thing. And it's way easier to pretend and not talk about it than to do things like this. And so we, we are called as the people of God into these difficult places, into these uncomfortable places where we have to grapple with stuff that you are not a part of but actually has really shaped the contours of this conversation in Canada. And the natural inclination from non-Indigenous people is to be defensive and angry. It's not the way of Jesus. The way of Jesus is to say, what don't I know about this? And what, do I, what can I learn about this? And, and yes, ask questions. Norm and I, before he passed, we would go to Denny's and ask lots of questions. I, I asked lots of questions, but I had a friend, and it was in the context of friendship. So when we think about reconciliation nationally, I have no idea what that looks like. But what I do know is I have indigenous friends that I can ask, I mean, in friendship with, in relationship with, and that that, friends, is our responsibility of what, what do we do? And as we are going through the book of Amos, starting next week for six weeks, rooted in the book of Amos, Amos is going to call the people of God into these, these places of injustice. And so um, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being a church that is willing to enter into this because without your support, we would not be here five years down the road. So bless you, uh, for this journey, because it's not an easy one, all right? Let me pray. Lord, thank you uh, for Joel and for Dion. We thank you, Jesus, for the gospel uh, that meets us, as Joel and Dion said, meets us wherever we're at. For those in this room who struggle in many different ways, Jesus, I pray you would meet them. For our church and for our responsibility, Jesus, continue to meet us on this initiative, in this, on this journey, Lord. We don't know what we're doing, Jesus, but we have seen your providence all the way through. I pray a blessing on Joel and his ministry. Lord, I pray a blessing on Dion and her family and her counseling practice. And Lord, may both of their voices increase. For your fame, we pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't you give them a round of applause, guys? Well done.